So I want to look at a couple of examples with you of applications of quadratic functions. And so in this first example, we're going to be given the function to use. In the second example, we're going to have to come up with that function to use. So I want to give you one nice example of each different type. So this one says a ball is thrown upward from an initial height of 12 feet. Its height in feet h of x, which you know better as y, so its height in feet, so that vertical distance is given by that y value, above the ground can be modeled by h of x or y equals negative 0.1 x squared plus 0.7 x plus 12, where x is the ball's horizontal distance. So it's vitally important that in the context of these word problems that you recognize what x represents for you in the problem and what y represents for you in the problem. So in this problem, I know that y will give me my vertical distance or my height, and x will give me the horizontal distance from where that ball was thrown. So then when they ask me questions, I'll know whether they're asking me, me about an x value or they're asking me about a y value. So looking at that function, then we can draw a rough sketch of what this would look like. So this is a quadratic, so this is going to be a parabola. The fact that this number in front of x squared is negative tells us that we're going to have a parabola that opens down. So it says a ball is thrown upward from an initial height of 12 feet. So starting here at a height of 12 feet, this ball is thrown upward. And then, so eventually, and again, because this gravity takes over it's going to go down but also we know it's going to go down because this is a parabola that opens down so eventually it's going to come back down now I don't need to worry about anything else on that parabola other than that and in a different color here if you want to see that full parabola then we could go back in this direction and we could go down below but in the context of a real life situation we start there when at an initial height of 12 feet and that ball is thrown upward and so eventually it's going to have to come back down so my apologies for the roughness of the sketch but somewhere in here is where it's going to reach its maximum and we know that better as the vertex so in the context of this problem what does that what does the two parts of that vertex give me well, my x value gives me a horizontal distance, and my y value gives me a vertical distance or a height. That's what the problem told me. It said its height will be given by y, so I'm my vertical distance above the ground, and x is the horizontal distance. So x and y in the context of this problem is going to be my horizontal distance and my vertical distance. And so we've got this maximum here at our vertex and so we're going to keep this in mind when we go through and answer our questions now before we, and before we even do that if I wanted to find that vertex because this the questions are asking me about maxes so if my problem is asking me about a maximum then that tells me I'm going to need both pieces of this vertex and so I can find the x value at that vertex by doing my minus b divided by 2a and then I can find that y value by taking what I get for that x value and plugging it in to my function to get that. So let's go ahead and do that over here on this blank page. So we've got our function h of x is equal to negative 0.1x squared plus 0.7x plus 12. So plus 0.7x plus 12. So if I wanted to find my vertex, then I could find the x value by doing negative b over 2a. So here's my value for a, there's my value for b. So negative b divided by 2a would be negative 0.7 divided by 2 times negative 0.1. And so that would give me negative 0.7 divided by negative 0.2. So that would be a negative divided by a negative. That would be a positive. And so pull out your calculator and do 
negative 0.7 divided by negative 0.2 on your calculator. So 0.7 divided by 0.2 and that would give you 7 over 2 or 3.5. So my x value would be 3.5. And then my y value I would get by taking that x value and plugging it into my equation. So this would be negative 0.1 times 3.5 that value squared plus 0.7 times 3.5 and then plus 12. So that would give that to me. Now obviously it's, this is the point where you want to use a calculator. So give me just a second and I'm going to go over it. And I'm using a graphing calculator. If you don't necessarily need a graphing calculator, you can use, you should use a basic scientific calculator or something that will do squares and stuff for you. I have a graphing calculator on my computer so that's what I'm going to use. Just use that graphing calculator to do that. Um, again, if you don't have a graphing calculator, you could do this on a scientific calculator. So this is going to be negative 0.1 times 3.5 squared, so negative 0.1 times 3.5 squared, plus, and then 0.7 times 3.5, and then plus 12. So the nice thing about the graphing calculator is it will do order operations for you. So it's going to do 3.5 squared for me, then it's going to multiply it by negative 1, and then it's going to do 0.7 times 3.5, and then it's going to add those three values together. And so we get is 13.225. So my y value is 13.225. So my y value here is 13.225. So I've got my x and my y value respectively. So now let's go see if we can answer questions that they ask of us in this problem. So part A here says find the ball's maximum height. So if I look back up here, it says its height in feet is given by my y value. And it asks me to find the maximum, which tells me I'm looking for the vertex. And since in the context of this problem, height is referred to as my y value, then I come over here where I just did that work, and there, in terms of my height, there is my maximum height. So the maximum height here would be 13.225, and it says my height is in feet. So that would be my maximum height. My maximum height would be 13.225 feet. Now, when you go to type in your answer on my math lab, this is where you would need to read what they ask you to round to. They may ask you to round to one decimal. That would be 13.2. may ask you to round to two decimals. That would be 13.23 if I rounded that to two decimals. Or if they wanted the exact value, I'd just give them the whole thing, 13.225 feet. So that's where you're going to have to read very, very carefully and make sure that you round appropriately because it will count it wrong if you round incorrectly so be very very careful about that all right and then part b of this problem says how far from where the ball was thrown does this maximum height occur so how far from where it was thrown and so if i come back over here and read the problem it says x is the horizontal distance in feet from where the ball was thrown. So now I'm looking for the x value at the vertex. That's what they're asking me for on part b here is what is that x value. And we found that x value to be 3.5 feet. So 3.5 feet would be my x value in that situation. So they're going to ask you separately for both parts of that vertex a lot of times. And so that's where you've got to know from the context of the problem, am I looking for the x value? Am I looking for the y value? It's not that you, it's not hard to find the vertex. You just plug it into your formula because of the form it was in. It's then can you answer the question they, they ask you? And that's where you've got to know what x represents and what y represents. So the, the maximum, the x value where that maximum height occurs is at three and a half feet. All right, and the last part of this says, how far does the ball travel horizontally? So I'm looking for an x value because that's what x represented for me in this problem was that horizontal distance. So how far does the ball travel horizontally before hitting the ground? 
So if I go back and look at my picture, my rough picture that I drew here, so here the ball was thrown upward. My graph is not to scale by any way, shape, or form, but we figured out that we, the ball was thrown upward. It reached a maximum height, and then it came back down. So here, this point on my graph is where it hit the ground, that point right there. So when it hits on the ground, my y value, or my height, would be 0. So I want to find out what is x when my y value is 0. So I want to take my equation here, my function, and set it equal to 0. And so I want to do negative 0.1 x squared plus 0.7 times x plus 12, all going to be equal to 0. So this is where you have a choice in terms of how you could go through and solve this. It would be totally up to you. You could do it with the quadratic formula. If you do it with the quadratic formula, you're going to have some decimals, and you're going to have to plug those decimals into the quadratic formula. That is perfectly acceptable if you want to do that. If you wanted to get rid of the decimals and make this a little bit easier to deal with, one of the, th the things that you could do is you could come in here and divide everything by 0.1. So, and you could actually divide by a negative 0.1 if you wanted to to make it a little bit nicer. So let's do that to get rid of the decimals. So let's divide through by negative 0.1. And divide by negative 0.1 and divide by negative 0.1 and divide by negative 0.1. So if we do that, this becomes x squared minus, so you take 0.7, divide it by negative 0.1, use your calculator if you need to. If I, if I do that, that's going to leave me with 7x, and then 12 divided by negative 0.1, do it on your calculator, you're going to get negative 120. And all that's going to be equal to 0. Negative 0.1, or 0.1, let's just talk about the negative, is just the negative, but the 0.1, that's the same thing as 1 tenth. So basically what I did in, in dividing by negative 0.1, I was actually multiplying everything by 10. So multiplying everything by 10, got rid of my decimals. I used the negative to make this a little bit nicer to look at. And so that's why 12 divided by negative 0.1 became negative 120 because basically I, did, I multiplied everything by 10 since I was dividing by 1 tenth. I was multiplying by the reciprocal. So now that's a much nicer equation to deal with. So now it'd be pretty easy to plug into the quadratic formula. Your value for a would be 1, your value for b would be negative 7, your value for c would be negative 120. But one of the things now that becomes a little bit easier to do is see can we factor this. And so in this situation just take the time to see if you can factor this. So x squared be x and x. And then I want to find two numbers that are going to multiply to give me negative 120 and are going to add to give me negative 7. Now you, you've got a calculator, so you could sit there and think about all the different ways that you could get 120 and, and just start using those to help you get to the two solutions. But what's going to get that for you is 18 is 15 and 8, sorry. So 15 and 8 is going to get me the 120. So I'm going to have 15 here and 8 there. So 15 times 8 does give you 120. Now I need a negative 120, so one of them is going to have to be positive, and one of them is going to have to be negative. And in this situation, I need the 7 to be negative, so I need the 15 to be negative, and I need the 8 to be positive, so I need x minus 15 times x plus 8. Negative 15 times 8 will give me negative 120, and then negative 15 plus 8 will give me the negative 7 that I have there. So if I set each one of those equal to 0, so I take x minus 15, set that equal to 0, and that gives me x equal to 15, and if I take x plus 8 and set that equal to 0, that gives me x equal to negative 8. Now, in the context of this problem, it says how far does that ball travel horizontally before hitting the ground? Well, we cannot have something travel a negative 8 feet. So that is not going to be a valid solution for the context of this problem. But x equal to 15 is. So that ball is going to travel 15 feet before it hits the ground. Again, 
if, if you did not see to divide everything by negative 0.1 and then see how to factor, then you could have just plugged these numbers in that you were given originally, the negative 0.1, the positive 0.7, the positive 12. You could have plugged those into the quadratic formula. You would have had to dealt with the decimals. Um, doing this allowed me to not have to deal with the decimals, and you could have easily just plugged this into the quadratic formula as well. You would have plugged in 1 for A, negative 7 for B, and negative 120 for C, and you, once you simplified it down, you would have gotten these two solutions of positive 15 and negative 8. And then in the context of the problem, you'll know that the solution is the positive answer in this case, which would have been the 15 feet. So it's still the same thing that you've done before algebraically in terms of solving. It's just now put in the context of a word problem. And so make sure you read carefully, but they're disguising different things that you, we've talked about before. So we've talked about finding where something's equal to zero. That's just our different methods that we have to solve quadratic equations. And in this chapter here, 3.1, this very first section, you've talked about how to algebraically find the vertex when it's in this form here, this ax squared plus bx plus c, we find our x value by doing minus b over 2a, and we find our y value by plugging in this x value to get it. And then from there, you just got to be able to answer the question that they're asking you, and that's where you've got to know what each different piece of the x and the y value, what they're representing in the context of that problem. So let's look at a second example where we, we have to come up with the function. So it says a fourth grade class decides to enclose a rectangular garden, so you got shape of a rectangle, using the side of the school as one side of the rectangle. So they're going to make a garden, and on one side here, they're going to have the school. Sorry about that. So on one side here, they're going to have the school. So this is going to be the school. And they want to enclose this garden and using that as one of the sides. So they're not going to put any fencing there, but they are going to come off of the school and put fencing on three sides. So they're going to put fencing on three sides to make this into a rectangular garden. And it says, what is the maximum area that the class can enclose with 32 feet of fence? So this is how much fencing they have. They have 32 feet of fence. And they want to put fencing on three sides to make a garden in the shape of a rectangle. So that's how much I have in all. So this 32 feet represents the perimeter or how much I have to put on those three sides. So I don't know how much I'm going to put on each one of those three sides, so I'm going to have to use some variables to help me represent these sides. Now, since this is a rectangle, then this side and this side are going to be the same. So I'm going to label both of those as x. So if I have 32, and that represents my perimeter, then if I put x and x on each one of those sides, then what I've used is the sum of those two sides, which is 2x. So I've used x and used x. For perimeter, we always add, so that's why I'm adding x and x. So we've used 2x. So how much would we have left to put down here on this side. Well, if I have 32 in all, and I've used so much of it, then I can write an expression for how much I have left. And that expression for how much I have left would be 32 minus how much I've used. So 32 minus 2x. And so I can put my expression here of 32 minus 2x. Now, in, in the context of this problem, it, you know, I drew it this way. We could have drawn it the other way. It would have been the same thing. No matter which way I draw it, it's still going to be the same kind of situation. There's a couple different ways you can draw the picture, but you get the idea from, hopefully, from that picture there. 
All right, so we've got our situation set up. We've got everything labeled like we have to get labeled. Now we can answer the question here. It says, what should the dimensions of the garden be? So I need to find X, which will lead me to this, in order to yield this maximum area. So I want to maximize area. So if I want to maximize my area, I need a formula for area. Well, we know that the area of a rectangle is always length times width. And so in this situation, whichever one you want to call the length, whichever one you want to call the width, it doesn't matter. But i got to take the product of those two sides of that rectangle. And so the product of the two sides of that rectangle would be x times 32 minus 2x. That would give me my area. And so that tells me my area which is a function of x, so I'm going to use my function notation, my area as a function of x, distribute this into both of my terms there, and I have 32x minus 2x squared. Now, if we want this to be written in the form that we're used to, we need this to be ax squared plus bx plus c. And so I'm going to turn this around and make this negative 2x squared plus... 32x. Okay. So there is my function that I am going to work with. All right, so using that function, so a of x being equal to negative 2x squared plus 32x. My problem says that I want to maximize the area. And I want to find the dimensions that are going to give me that maximum area. Well, this is a parabola that opens down. And so my max, again, is going to be here at my vertex. So I'm still doing the same kind of thing that I did with the previous problem. So if I want to find the x value at my vertex, the x value at my vertex would be negative b, so negative 32, divided by 2 times a, so 2 times negative 2. So that would be negative 32 divided by negative 4, and that would give me positive 8. So let's just stop right there and see what we know. Well, if we know that x should be 8, if we know that x needs to be 8, then that means over here that this needs to be 8. So however you want to think about this, but you've got 8 and 8, so you've used 16, okay? So if x is 8... We've used 2 times 8, so we've used 16. So what we have left is 32 minus 16, which is 16. So I've used 8 and 8, so I've used 16, so what I have left here is 16. So I can tell you what the dimension should be in order to yield that maximum area. It needs to be 8 feet by 16 feet. So the dimensions that are going to yield this maximum area is going to be 8 feet by 16 feet. Again, it doesn't matter which way you draw it or build it. You can build it that way or build the other way. It depends on which, which way you want to look at it. But those are the dimensions that would yield that maximum area. It would be 8 feet by 16 feet. Because I have it labeled appropriately and because I know what X represents in this problem, once I was able, sorry about that, once I was able to find this x value, then I was able to go back to my picture and find everything that I, that I needed here. Now, one of the questions they may ask you, which they did not ask me in this problem, but one, one of the questions they could ask you is, besides what are the dimensions, is what is that maximum area? Well, what, what that maximum area would be would be the product of 8 times 16. So you could do 16 times 8 or 8 times 16, however you want to think about it. And that would give me the maximum area that I could enclose here. Or also what you have is you have that same thing down here in the fact that 
in this situation, X represents one of the sides of this rectangle, and A represents the area. So I could also plug 8 into this equation here, or into my function here, and that would have given me the maximum area as well. So that, that's an additional question that they could ask you is, what is that maximum area? And here you could get it a couple of ways. Once you know the dimensions, then you could just multiply those two things together to get that maximum area. So if you did 8 times 16, that would give you 128. So the maximum area would be 128 square feet. If they asked you. Okay. But again, it's that's a situation where it's a lot more work coming up with the formula. Once you have the formula, then you're back to the same situation as the previous problem where you're just trying to understand in the context of your problem, what does X represent? What does Y represent? What are those different things going to give me? And then using all that to answer the question that you are asked. So those are, those are the two types of word problems that you're going to encounter. Some where they already give you a formula, just make sure you know in the context of the problem what is represented in that formula. Usually they're asking you about vertex or maybe something about finding the zeros, which is what we did on the first problem. And then there are going to be some, very similar to this, where you're going to have to come up with a formula. And then from there, once you go to answer your questions, you need to know what X represents in your problem, what Y represents in your problem, so that you can correctly answer the questions that you are asked in that specific problem.